So I've discussed several different types of levitation on this channel. From acoustic, electromagnetic, and implosive. But are there various forces always totally exclusive of each other? Can one at times give rise to the other? Here, a two pound brick is propelled out of a rotating chamber via vortex lift. Could sound vibrations generate a similar force? Stay with me as I attempt to explain a possible connection between this flying brick and the Tibetan levitation technique. Out of all of the accounts of sonic levitation in alternative science, probably the most referenced is the Tibetan levitation account. Not only is it relatively recent, being set in the 1930s, but unlike other accounts, some also recent and others ancient, there are many precise and specific details, details which at least allow for attempts at a scientific analysis. Late author and pilot Bruce Cathy has produced probably the most detailed analysis to date. There seems to be multiple versions of the account, each with the same main details, but with one or more small details that are not mentioned in the others. These variations may simply be due to details that are lost in translations, as the earlier versions of the story were at first published in the German, Swedish, and Danish languages. I will read the main gist of the story from the book, The Secret History of Ancient Egypt, by Herbie Brennan. And then I will mention the additional details from the other accounts later in the discussion. The story references the sketch shown here that was allegedly made by a Swedish doctor, simply named Jarl. It says that sometime in the 1930s, Jarl was invited by a Tibetan friend to visit a monastery southwest of a town called Leza. While there, he was taken to a nearby cliff where the Lamas were engaged in a curious construction pro project. Some 250 meters up the cliff face was a cave entrance fronted by a broad ledge onto which the monks were building a stone wall. About the same dis distance from the base of the cliff as the ledge was, was above it, there was a large flat bowl-shaped stone that was embedded in the ground. Some distance behind it was a group of monks, some of whom were equipped with massive drums and trumpets. Among them was a monk who was using a knotted rope to measure out precisely where each of the others should stand. As Jarl watched, the monks positioned 13 drums and 6 trumpets in a 90 degree arc around the bowl stone. Some 8 to 10 monks formed a line behind each instrument. At the center of the arc were three monks with drums. The one in the middle had a small drum that was hung around his neck. The monks on either side of him had larger drums hung in wooden frames. On either side of those drums came monks supporting three meter or 10 foot long trumpets that were called ragdons. Behind them were more drums slung from frames, including a pair of the largest drums that Jarl had ever seen. Even further out were, uh, along the arc were alternate, alternating placements of trumpets and drums. He noticed that each drum was open at the end and that this end was invariably pointed towards the bowl stone. As the doctor watched, a yak drawn sled dragged a one, one and a half meter long by one meter wide by one meter thick stone block to the bowl stone. A group of straining monks manhandled it off of the sled and with great difficulty into the bowl like the depression. When it was in place, the monk at the center of the ark began to chant rhythmically and beat the small drum. The sound made was so staccato that it hurt Jarl's ears. The rhythm was then taken up by the trumpets while the attendant monks struck the large drums with their leather headed sticks. The rhythm was slow at first, but gradually increased in pace until Jarl, until uh, to Jarl, the sound seemed continuous. Even so, the beat of the smallest drum remained discernible throughout everything else. 
For three or four minutes, nothing else happened. Then to Gerald's complete astonishment, the block in the center of the bowl stone wobbled suddenly. He saw the monks slowly tilt their trumpets and drums upward, and as they did so, the block rose with them as if lifted by invisible hands. The sound never faltered. The heavy block sped up as it followed an arc trajectory towards the cave mouth 250 meters up the cliff. When it reached the edge, the sound was cut off and it crashed down in a spray of dust and gravel. The yak-driven sled then dragged another stone to the bowl stone. Jarl discovered that the monks could raise five stones in, uh, in an hour's time using this technique. Occasionally, a block would shatter when it was dropped on the ledge, but the pieces were simply pushed over the side by the monks at the cave mouth. Now, another version gives more details about the authors of the account as well as some additional measurement details. It says again here that a Swedish engineer by the name of Olaf Alexanderson wrote about this account in the publication curiously called Implosion Number 13. It says, the following report is based on observations which were made only 20 years earlier in Tibet. He says that I have made a report from the civil engineer and flight manager, Henry Kelson, a friend of mine. Kelson later on included this report in his book, The Lost Techniques. This is his report. And so here we get a little bit more information about Dr. Jarl. We find out that he was a friend of Henry Kelson's and that he also studied at Oxford. And that it was during this time that he became friends with the young Tibetan student. It says that a couple years later, it was 1939, and Dr. Jarl made a journey to Egypt for the English Scientific Society. There he was seen by a messenger of his Tibetan friend and urgently requested to come to Tibet to treat a high lama who was ill. After Dr. Jarl got the leave, he followed the messenger and arrived after a long journey by plane and yacht caravans at the monastery where the old lama and his friend who was now holding a high position were now living. Dr. Jarl stayed there for some time and because of his friendship with the Tibetans, he learned a lot of things that other foreigners had no chance to hear about or to observe. One day, Dr. Jarl's Tibetan friend took him to a place in the neighborhood of the monastery and showed him a sloping meadow, which was surrounded in the northwest by high cliffs. In one of the rock walls, at a height of about 250 meters, was a big hole, which looked like the entrance to a cave. In front of this hole, there was a platform upon which the monks were building a rock wall. The only access to this platform was from the top of the cliff, and the monks lowered themselves down with the help of ropes. In the middle of the meadow, about 250 meters from the cliff, was a polished slab of rock with a bowl-like cavity in the center. The account goes on similarly as before, but provides an additional measurement detail, given the diameter of one meter for the bowl stone, as well as a depth of 15 centimeters. All of the accounts seem to detail that the stones to be lifted were placed inside of the uh, depression. But since the stones were one and a half meters long, it would not be possible for them to actually fit within the, the depression. So the stones must be, have been paid, placed probably just above it. Additional details include the distance from the arc of the musical instruments to the stone slab, which was given here as 63 meters, as well as a flight time of three minutes for the levitated blocks. So besides the process itself, what is also interesting is the specific data and measurements provided in the account, the exact dimensions of the musical instruments themselves, the distance between the band and the stone, the height of the cliff, and even the dimensions of the stone. These details enable us to make some rough calculations as to the energy and forces which would have been involved for this to be possible. Looking very closely at the, at the description, a few small details really stand out to me. 
One is that the stone to be levitated was placed in or over the bowl-like depression. Now at first deduction, one would suspect that the depression would serve only to focus and direct the acoustic energy upwards at the block, just like a focusing dish. But we also know from Victor Schauberger's implosion theory that bowl-like shapes, as well as cylindrical and ovoid geometric shapes, can twist matter and energy into a vortex motion. The account seems to support this as it says that after the few minutes, the stone began to wobble just before taking off. In another version of the account taken from the article Antigravity and Gravity, written by David Pratt, says that the stone rocked back and forth even during its three-minute flight. This description sounds very much like what is happening here in the implosive vortex lift experiment of the two-pound stone that I showed at the beginning of the video. Slowing it down to one quarter and then one eighth speed, we can readily see how the stone begins to rock back and forth as it is caught up in the vortex and continues to do so until it leaves the rotating chamber. This rocking appears to typically happen in objects that are not spherical or ovoid as the result of unbalanced cyclical forces. The stone is also propelled in, in, propelled in a parabolic arc just as any projectile. And so the question is, are sound vibrations capable of doing this as well? Were the stones that the Tibetans were levitating actually caught up in a powerful acoustically induced vortex? And what about energy? Would it be possible for even 100 mu musical instruments to generate enough acoustical energy to lift a multi-ton stone to a height of even one centimeter, let alone lift and propel it over so many meters? The details of the account can be used to estimate how much energy it would take to lift each stone over a the distance and height of 250 meters. The article says that the stones were one meter wide and by one meter thick and one and a half meters long. This yields a volume of about one and a half cubic meters or 52.93 cubic feet. It is not said what type of rocks the stones were, but if they were sandstone with a density of 145 pounds per cubic feet, then the weight at that volume would be about 3.84 tons. If the stones were granite, which would have a density of 175 pounds per square uh, per cubic foot, then the weight would be about 4.63 tons. The stones took a parabolic arc, traversing a horizontal distance of 250 meters and a vertical distance of 250 meters. But for sake of simplicity and demonstration, we can represent this as a quarter circle with a radius of 250 meters. The travel distance would then be one quarter of the cir uh, circle's circumference, which in this case would be about 392 and a half meters. Knowing the mass and distance traveled, we can calculate the energy needed to lift each stone. Plugging in the mass of 3.84 tons, which is 3,481, and a quarter kilograms for a sandstone block and nine and a half nine point eight meters per second squared for the acceleration of gravity as well as the 392 and a half meters for the total distance we get an energy of well over 13 million joule, joules of energy the article says that the stones took about three minutes to cover this distance so the power would be this energy divided by the three minute flight time Converting three minutes into 180 seconds and then dividing it into the energy figure yields a power figure of 74,392.38 watts. But if the blocks were granite, then the energy would be over 16 million joules for a power of about 89,757.44 watts. But is it even probable to generate sh such power with even a large band? no matter how huge the instruments. We see here that a typical rock band in an arena would use about 15,000 watts of electrical power for in order to produce this acoustic intensity. But larger bands can use up to between 80,000 and 400,000 watts of electrical power. Even with an 
efficiency of only 25% of conversion from electrical power to acoustic power, that is still a whopping 100,000 watts being generated in the upper range. Looking at our previously derived figures again, we see that it would take significantly less than 100,000 watts to even, uh, even to propel the stones in the manner described in the Tibetan account. So it seems that it is at least remotely probable that enough power could be generated by a large enough band. However, most of the energy generated by the band would simply dissipate into the environment as audible sound. But what if we could divert and build upon this energy rather than letting it dissipate? This is where resonance comes in. Now we know that resonance allows us to create a standing wave into which we can continuously add energy into a system at a much faster rate than it can be fully dissipated. The harmonic relations that author Bruce Cathy points out here in the analysis of the Tibetan Levitation article strongly implies that the Tibetan monks were doing exactly this. And these harmonic relations would be why the measurements and positioning of the people, instruments, and the stones themselves need to be so precise. Since these relations were predetermined, then it can be deduced that the monks likely gathered this information through both experiment and calculations over some time. We might imagine them sounding off musical instruments into the environment and then observing which musical notes and combinations of tones will be amplified and reflected back the strongest in that immediate environment. Hills, valleys, mountains, caves, all of these structures will ultimately have a collective effect on which frequencies would be the most resonant in that particular space. From this, musical instruments could then be fashioned and customized to reflect the wavelengths of these frequencies. And as these are lower spectrum audible frequencies than the wavelengths, and thus the instruments that are based on them will be quite large, just as reported with the 10 foot long trumpets that are referenced in the article. Additional information would enable the monks to know about how much energy will be needed to move the stones over the needed distance, as well as the flight trajectory of the stones. Again, we see this in the apparent harmonic relations that are noted by Casey. Now, while this might sound fanciful to some, we, we must keep in mind that using mathematical equations for energy and motion, we accomplish this very same thing being able to predict the flight trajectory of projectiles, as well as how far they will travel based on the available energy and their mass. It appears that the monks were doing this very same thing, but just in a different way, as the stones were essentially massive, slow moving projectiles, moving in the typical parabolic arc. And so again, going back to the different types of levitation, in which you know can be due to vortex lift, which can involve hydrodynamics and aerodynamics. There can be levitation due to some type of attraction or repulsion, as in electromagnetism and electrostatics. And there theoretically can be levitation due to anti-gravity, specifically a reversal of gravity or negative gravity. It might also be possible that a combination of these principles could be used in a single levitation technique. In other words, was the acoustic vortex that the sole cause of the levitation in Tibet? Were the stones given negative weight due to anti-gravity, causing them to become not only weightless, but also buoyant? Or were they made lighter and lifted by the vortex? These are important questions as the, there are many stones in structures from the ancient world, which are unbelievably are 100 to even 400 times heavier than the stones that were used in the Tibetan account. If it took so many people and musical instruments to levitate stones around three and a half to four tons, then how many people would it take to lift a 1,000 ton stone like the Stone of the South at Baalbek in Lebanon? The Tibetan technique would have been a truly spectacular sight to behold, but it was extremely energy intensive and not particularly gentle as the stones were allowed to crash to the ground, a procedure that would 
most likely shatter a much heavier stone. Hence, as advanced as the uh, Tibetan technique was, we might speculate that even more advanced levitation techniques may have been developed by the ancients in order to move stones in the upper megalithic range. We might speculate that the Tibetan levitation technique, as well as the processes to derive the harmonic resonances needed to accomplish it, were most likely passed down to the monks from generation to generation, dating back, dating back to distant antiquity. If so, the technique and others like it are most assuredly the sources of the legends that we know of today. We might also imagine that they will certainly seem like magic to people that are not privy to the inner workings of other processes that are actually rooted in tangible scientific principles. Now, apparently videos were taken of the astonishing feat, but of course, those videos were confiscated, never to be seen again. We can only imagine then what other wonders from time have been deliberately hidden from us. Wonders that are only glimpsed at in stray accounts as well as the stories and legends of old. This is just a preliminary discussion of this account. In a future video, I will attempt a more thorough and specific calculation of the collective acoustic energy outputs of the musical instruments that will be generated and involved in this technique. Included will be a discussion of Bruce Cathy's analysis of the harmonics that are highlighted here. I will also attempt to levitate this 108 pound monster. Thanks for watching and as always, stay tuned.